right? Okay. And the idea is that you go away and enhance these things and do formal proofs and checking and all the rest of this stuff. Right, okay, on with the show. Uh, what am I going to show you then? Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about clients and servers because we're going to restrict ourselves to client server networking. Right, so I need to say a bit more about that. So I can interpose proxies between them. Um, then I'll introduce the idea of basic and composite controls um, and finally I'll wrap up with some feature work. So firstly then briefly clients and servers. Um, there's a client and there's a server. You can come up with lots of different types for servers, but eventually you come down to this very simple one, um, which is that a server is something that receives messages of type A over a network and returns messages of type B in response. Right? For those who don't know Haskell, this IO you can read as over the network. Right? Networks are in the real world. And, um, so that is what a server is. Um, can you send anything across the network and get anything back? Well, no, you can't. You actually have what's called network protocols, right? And so briefly, um, we'll say that what you can send over a network is something called a mess or, or described by a type class of messages with two operations. One is transmit and one is receive. Um, these handles are sort of Haskell for network endpoint. Um, not all messages are the same. Well, hey, not all swami projectors are the same. Um, so we shall actually say that some messages are requests and some messages are responses. Right? So this is just using the class system. And all that I need in this talk is a single operation on request messages saying, what is your destination? That is, where are you going? Um, which I'll express as a string um, and an integer. So uh, a machine name and a port number. And we don't care about responses that we have um, exist. This example, or this talk, will use as an example the hypertext transfer protocol. Well, actually, I don't much care about the hypertext transfer protocol, but it's a nice example for this talk. Um, what are HTTP requests? Well, they consist of um, a first line, which is, um, or which describes an operation, that's the operation there, um, a resource that it's to work on, and get off, um, uh, and the protocol that's in use. I'm scared to touch this thing now. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to, in fact. Um, there is an association list of um, additional parameters which go with the request. And finally, an HTTP request has a body, which is a large amount of data that you can send over the request. Um, and all we need to know is that yes, um, HTTP requests are requests. That is, we can send and receive them across the network. Um, HTTP responses are the same thing in the other direction. Um, okay. So there's no rocket science here. There's no deep and meaningful ideas being buried here. This is just the network, uh, just the protocol that we need to demonstrate proxy program. So um, proxies, what are they? Well, a proxy stands in for a server, right? So this um, type equivalent will do us for the purpose of this talk. What is a proxy? Well, it stands for a server, um, and it doesn't change the protocol in any way. Right, so if you were talking to an HTTP server before, you wouldn't expect the proxy to suddenly make it behave as an FTP one. Right, it's still HTTP, um, whether the proxy's there or not. Right, okay, the simplest proxy on the planet expressed in Slideware. There it is, right, that is the proxy. What does it do? Well, it takes a request, X, um, it works out what its destination is, connects to that destination, sends x to the destination, that is, it transmits it, it gets the result back from the destination. There's some stuff to do with flushing buffers, which if you don't put it in, it calls you endless grief, and then it returns the result that it's got from the destination. Right. Now, I hope you can see that that is clearly correct. Right? I mean, you know, there's no argument 
like, well, that didn't say about 10 lines long. Right? So it is a transparent proxy. You can't argue about whether it's you know, sort of succeed or fail. As long as Haskell works, that works. OK, so what, we, what the plan is to take this transparent proxy and gradually enhance its capabilities. So rather than just piling everything up in a disorganized heap, we'll try to proceed in a systematic way. Um, the idea um, of control is very significant in the area I work in, which is computer security. So you'll often hear people in the security community talk about the word control. Um, in this more general setting in the functional programming conference, you might want to use adapter instead of control. But the control is very well understood in computer security. What is a control? Well, it's something that you can give a proxy to, and it gives you back another proxy that hopefully is enhanced in some way. But of course, it could be made worse, but the idea is that we make things better. So um, you give it a proxy, it gives you back another one, and that's a control. The first of the four controls I'll show you is something called a tinker control. Um, what does it do? Well, it adapts a proxy by replacing its requests. So we have a replacement function here, f, and a proxy, and it simply applies um, this replacement function to the request before it gets to the proxy. Right? I'll give you examples of each of these um, now to convince you that they're actually sensible things to do. So the example of the tinker control that I'll give you is anonymization. Right? On the web, lots of sites would like to track you, the citizen. Right? They'd like to gather information about you. And the way that they do that is they look at information that your web client hands over in its user agent stream. Right? This information is extraordinarily precise. So if we look at this screen, which is um, from a Safari browser, it tells you the exact build of that particular web browser. Right? right down to, I don't know how many decimal places and so on. But there's a lot of information there. And it turns out that almost every machine, in fact, I'll conjecture, every machine in this uh, room has a slightly different configuration of installed um, equipment, different operating system, and so on. Um, and that enables people to track you. What can we do about this? Well, one thing you could do is you could simply have a proxy that says, no, I will not hand over the user agent screen. That is not a good idea because it means you lose lots of facilities that come from a specific user agent. Right? The next thing you could do is you could say, well, okay, I'll replace the user agent string with Donald Duck. Right? Okay, that is also an extremely poor thing to do because unless everyone in the room thinks of Donald Duck, you've identified yourself very specifically. You're the only person on the planet with a browser called Donald Duck. <laughs> so what you need to do is you need to replace a particular user agent string with some generic one. So if every user of Safari agrees on that particular string, then its value for identifying you will decrease markedly. Right. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to replace um, user agent strings um, with generic ones. Right. So every Safari string will be conflated down to one of them. And similarly for Chrome and so on, I'm not Safari. Um, so here's what we call the worker function that actually does that. And, um, uh, it's written slide where, so I don't need to go into too much detail. It looks for the user agent header among the headers, and if there is one, then there's this gen function which I haven't elaborated, which you use there, and it actually picks up um, specific user agents and replaces them with vaguer ones or, or, or ones the same. And if there isn't a user agent string, well, we don't try and invent one. That's the Donald Duck property, remember. We just let the thing go. Right. OK, so that's the worker function. And where does my combinator come in? Well, in order to build that particular control, um, you need to initialize it. Um, so this is um, an anonymization control. 
The need for I.O. is that often controls will need to initialize from, say, the file system. Right? This one doesn't in particular, but it makes it consistent to have an I.O. type. Right? All initializations will use I.O. just in case one of them does. Right? It just makes the whole thing more consistent. So that was the first combinator then, a tinker, which simply removes user agents and replaces them with generic. So that's information flow outwards. Um, next combinator is a tailor, which goes the other way. Um, so what does a tailor do? Well, it has a function, and it replaces or um, adapts responses. Right? So it, re it replaces the response in the context of um, knowing what, both what the response is and what the original request was. Why might you need one of these things? Well, um, it turns out that when you um, have a proxy, you often want to do authentication, right? So lots of systems managers still think it's 1950, and everyone's applied their credentials before they log into any system, and the web is no different. Um, so the web has a very simple authentication system uh, it takes usernames and passwords, um, and in this case, the username is smiley, and the password is, of course, let me in. Um, you know, it's one of those like six names, and I will always find it. And it replaces them with hash strings, right? So, given that we have usernames and passwords, we simply want to check um, when someone asks for some content that they're allowed to have it. Um, so, what this um, uh, authentication worker function actually does is it looks for what's called a proxy authorization string in the header and it checks it against the database of valid credentials. What's all that jargon mean? That would be an entry in a database of valid credentials. Right? So if you can actually produce that string um, um, from your browser, then your request should be allowed. Otherwise, although we have the content that we would give you, we don't, right? What we do instead is we issue a demand for authentication. Right? And we'll see that on the next slide. So this says, um, uh, have you initialized an authentication control where you load up the credentials, presumably from the file system, and then you have a tailor combinator that says, well, if the request is Success, or, sorry, if the user can successfully authenticate themselves in the request header, then we give them back their content. Otherwise, we give them back a demand that they authenticate themselves. And that's why you get this real stubborn behavior from web browsers that insist that you keep typing your password in until you get it right. They actually have the content to give you what they want. Um, soldiers, well, what is a soldier? A soldier is something that does work that you don't want them, you don't want to do yourself. Right? In fact, you have to pay them to do the job you do. Um, a soldier combinator lets you extend a proxy right, by adding additional functionality to it. Right? So if we look at a soldier, um, what is it? Well, it takes um, the request that you've made and the proxy, and it can actually choose to extend it, or it can choose to use the original proxy. Right. So an example of that, um, this isn't really a control, but caching, um, the idea that when you fetch a web page, you store it locally, so that you don't have to go and fetch it again. Right? Because network access is assumed to be more expensive than local access to a cache. Right. It's always false in some ways. I won't walk you through this entire slide, but what this does is it models a cache as a list of um, resource locators and pages, right? which is the dumbest uh, implementation possible. Right? Okay, so if you want to see if something's in the cache, you go walking all the way down until you find it, or you get to the end. Right? Um, that's what's called an executable specification, but it works. Um, so if you want a uh, cache, um, then all you have to do is say, well, uh, we've got a soldier 
combinator here, which takes a cache. And the reason I've demonstrated this to you is it demonstrates how proxies use state. Right? So a cache needs some state. And in this case, it starts off with this IO ref to an empty list. Right? So it shows you how state works. Final combinator, a very simple one, spying. Um, proxies are used for spying a lot, right? For recording information in various ways. I mean, not the sinister sort of, you know, M15 type stuff, but um, just simple traffic logging and billing and this kind of thing all require a combinator here. Uh, and all this does is, is it has a function which can take the request and the response and somehow record it. So in this case, the IO type stands for and somehow record it. Okay. So um, this is almost too simple to warrant explanation, but all this does is it takes requests at the current time and stores them. Right. So as a combinator, uh, it simply writes the request and the time. And that's initialization of it. Uh, finally, and this is the big idea. If you want to make a big proxy with all of those small ones, that is how you do it. Right? You can just compose these things together. If you wanted to add more functionality, you would just add it to that composition. If you wanted to remove functionality, you could just take it away. If you want to replace a component or enhance it, and believe me, you will, because specifications change, then this is the function that we modify. It's much clearer and much easier to see. Okay, um, future work, just, just to finish off. Correctness matters in proxies because if you don't get it right, then people get convicted or malware spreads everywhere and so on. It would be nice to have skeletons with costs um, so you can work out how expensive these combinators work. Um, efficiency and performance, I'll take those together. Uh, proxies are, by definition, bottlenecks. They must be. Right? So if you look around at organisations, often the most powerful computer they have is what they call the firewall. It's because all the Facebook traffic goes through it. Right? It's absolutely vital that that thing runs fast. <laughs> okay, so I'll wrap up there and ask, are there any questions? As a server, yeah, I would have rather have expected a proxy to be a function from service to service. Yes, that is a good point. And um, so, generally, say um, I said that a proxy was equivalent to. Um, I said a proxy was equivalent to a server, and he's saying, well, why isn't a proxy a server transformer? Yeah. Um, yes, that is a very good point. I see if I find it for you. Yeah, this is the. Um, Slide is on so, so what you call controls are... Yeah, like yeah, that, that's right. Um, the reason that I've made that simplification is for all of the proxies I care about, the protocol doesn't change. Right? But there are some proxies, for example, tunnels, where it does matter. So, for example, an IPv4 to an IPv6 translator, yes, it does matter for them. Right? So that, that's going to be my second question, is why... Why don't you generalise to allow the... the oh, the indeed I can. I've simply simplified it for presentation purpose. And because all of the proxies that I think about have the property that they keep the protocol exactly the same. But yes, it's a good point. They're all stunned. It's the end of the day. They're on the caffeine low about them. Right. Is this like where you have a, a working version? That's, that's actually oh, yes, um, the actual paper that I've got is um, a list of script. So it can process web transactions, and indeed it often does while I'm working on it. Um, yes, it is, but then as a single user, you can't generate much web traffic. Right? I mean, I have tried to break this, even doing things like searching for virus signatures and so on. Um, networks are relatively slow, processes are relatively fast for a single user, right? So even, a, even in your wildest Facebook fantasies, you can't actually generate <laughs> enough um, web traffic to outpace that CPU in your network. It just doesn't happen. Yes, Helen? 
I don't think you dealt with screaming. It looked like your pro proxy takes the whole response and then decides what to do with it and then gives it to the client. So well, does it take the whole response? Um, most web servers now chop up responses into chunks, right? So um, the server will start generating some of these chunks even before it knows what the others are, right? So some of that's already being done by the server. But yes, I don't try to stream at all. But you'll often find servers sort of starting to send back their response even while they're computing the rest of it. Um, but just as a performance thing, that's why they're just chunked and coded. Right. And if you tried to download a large file, would that be a problem? Um, if you try, well, if the server is chunking it, no. Um, but if, if it did say, really, yes, here's 500 megabytes in one big thing, yes, it might be. Yeah. Um. Um, what software have you have you compared this to other proxy software that the engineer had it? Like, have you looked at using, a, like, I assume people use like Apache as a proxy or something like that? Well, um, I mean, the thing that you want to look at is things like Squid as a okay. huge proxy cache, okay. which is about 100,000 lines of C and so on. Um, yeah, I, I tried to look for actually the smallest proxy I could find. Um, yes. There's Farnish, that's also a proxy. Right. Oh, I'm sure there are lots. Yeah, I, I mean, I found a lot. But the smallest one I could find was something called Tiny Proxy. Right. I was trying to find out what the minimal size is, and that's about 7,500 lines of C. Um, and that's, that seems to be the smallest thing that calls itself a proxy. Right. And that's way too big. That's enormous. I mean, the, my entire implementation got been on the 250 rounds ago. Um, yes? Did you implement the SOX 5 proxy in your Okay. Um, no, I, I've only done variants on HTTP, various IMAPs and POPs and so on, and of course this telephone thing, um, SIP. Um, yeah, they're, they're, a, a lot of pro protocols that are invented now at the application level tend to be derived from HTTP. Um, you know, one good idea goes along. Anyway, you need to move Thank you very much. Uh,